Hello everyone. It is good to be here with you today as we look at Joshua chapter 4, the most one of the most exciting chapters in scripture in that this is the moment that uh, everything has been building up to. Uh, for 40 years, for a little over 40 years, the people of Israel from the time of Moses in the burning bush, the, the, the story has been mounting to this point where finally the people cross into the promised land. And this is chapter 4. This is the story of that actual day, of the very hours when the people actually crossed over into the, into the promised land. And so it's an exciting time. It parallels something we're all excited about in, in, the, in the future. It will be the day when finally we cross over into the land that God has promised. And so anyway, it's a very exciting story. I'm looking forward to getting into it with you today. And I hope to pull out of it. Uh, not only the story and familiarize you with it, but I also hope that we will pull away um, a couple of very practical applications that you can do, and I hope you will do, at home or in your family groups or in your assemblies, that you'll do this with each other so that it will really bring home what happened here in a very practical way for you and your family and build your faith and your family's faith. So we'll get into that near the end. Speaking of the end, I'd like to say that probably the best place to begin chapter 4 is at the end of chapter 4. The last two verses, let's read them together. Chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Now, 23 and 24. Here's what they say. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did in the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea, when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, number one, and number two, so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And so uh, Joshua, or the writer here, summarizes in Joshua's words, using his words, two very important key takeaways or purposes for the writing of this chapter, chapter four of Joshua. And so um, it begins uh, at the Jordan, and, and I'll just give us a, a quick a summary of it, a quick, a quick overview of the chapter, and then we'll jump back in. We'll jump in to see some contrasts and comparisons, and then make some applications for ourselves. So it begins with the story of the of the miraculous crossing of the uh, Jordan River. The water piles up on one side high clears out on the far end, it drains off, and it leaves the ground. God makes the ground dry so that the uh, the priest and the, carrying the ark go in first, and they wait at the center as the people then cross go across very hurriedly, very quickly. They scurry across, get to the other side, and then, um, and then certain men are chosen, one from each tribe, 12 men are chosen, who come back towards the center, pick up stones near where the uh, ark had been, where the priest stood, take those 12 stones back to the, into Jordan, uh, into Canaan on the dry land, and then the ark is carried out. And as soon as the priest carrying the ark step out, then the water rushes back into its place. Pretty dramatic story. You need to read it. Uh, the details are very exciting and very important. But that's the overview of what happened there. We're not told, by the way, where Joshua was. It's interesting that uh, this is a story that harkens back to Moses, but it's fresh in this story. And, um, and yet we are not told in either case where the leader went. So Joshua, it, and like Moses, before the story begins, are giving commands and directives and saying, this is what God wants, this is what God says, here's what we're going to do. And then it all takes place, but Joshua's not in there. It doesn't say where he stood. It tells what the people did. It tells what the priest did. It tells what these 12 men did. Joshua, he's gone. Moses, we know in his story that he holds out the, the rod and the water parts. But after that, we aren't really told where Moses is. Did he go first? Was he in the middle? Did he wait till the very last and cross after everybody else? I don't remember reading in there where it was that Moses was. Now, he shows up later after all of this. But in both of these stories, the leaders disappear. And though I don't think it is the this teaching I'm going to mention, this, print, this, this point I'm going to make here, I don't think it is really a point that Joshua chapter 4 was intended for. 
but I think it's something we can learn from, is that leaders, God's leaders, are there to hear from God and give direction, and then there to stay out of the way, out of the picture, and let God work with the people and people with God in order to build their faith, to create in them a fear for the Lord, a reverence, a respect, a, a, a trust in, in, in view of God that is bigger and greater because there's no other way. So if leaders are trying to do it for them, or if leaders are trying to get people to do what they think ought to be done, the ways they think it ought to be done, then people are going to be left either in slavery, or they're going to be kept out of the, all the promises that God has in mind for them. And so it's important for leaders, that's leaders in homes, like dads and parents. It's important for leaders in churches or communities of faith, it's important for us to point to people and say, this is the will of God. Go and do it. And then encourage people, our children, our families, our, our members in our congregations, to encourage them, go live this. Go try this. Go taste and see that the Lord is good. Go do it. And not for us to be afraid that when they try it, that somehow God is going to fail. He won't. He, he just won't. If they will live life like he says to live life, then they will experience him guaranteed. And their experience of him will be that, will create in them that fear for the Lord. They'll be amazed themselves at how powerful, how near, how active, how trustworthy God is. And there's not another way to do it. There's no shortcut to this. If the, Israel wanted a shortcut, you remember? 11 day little little skirt about the top of the wilderness and right into Canaan. And God said, no, that won't be good for you. It's not going to work out very well. So he led them through a more difficult path. And this is the path that we all have to go. There's no shortcut to it. It's not a bad path. It's a necessary means to a wonderful outcome. And so I encourage you, if you're a leader in any fashion, that, that you point people to God. And then you get out of the way and just encourage them, obey him, do it, follow, do what he says, see what happens, see what happens. And if they will, they will their faith will grow. And uh, if you get in the way and you try to nurse it along too much, you'll spoil it. So don't help them. Uh, let, point them, direct them, encourage them, and then let them experience that. Okay, that is probably not a point that is in this chapter, but I thought it was a good one to make. And I think there's an example here that maybe we can follow, uh, we can learn from. So I'm going to get back to chapter four now, in chapter four, and we're going to look at we are going to look at some comparisons and contrasts between the Red Sea crossing and the Jordan River crossing because Joshua said that these are he compared the two, and so we'll compare them. And isn't it interesting that um, that as we uh, I'm learning that the, a word or a phrase or a, a mention of something in this scripture harkens back many times to another place where the same word or phrase or, or um, story is told. And if we connect those two, there's a real connection there and, and, a, and a deeper level of insight, a, a new learning that's there. And I am, I'm just amazed by how God's word works that way. And so now when I read, I'm seeing those things all the time. I'm looking for them, in fact, and trying to be aware of them at least, not forcing them, but being aware of them. So there are many in this passage here. So here are a few that I found, and you probably have many more. They seem to be endless sometimes. So here's some important ones for me that I want to mention and for you to think about. First of all, that um, there's a new leader at the Red Sea, Moses, and there's a new leader, Joshua, at the Jordan. At the Red Sea crossing, they're exiting enemy territory, leaving Egypt. And the Jordan River crossing, they're entering new enemy territory, which is Canaan. Uh, the enemies are at their back at the Red Sea, coming up behind them. Their enemies are in front of them as they enter into the Jordan. The enemies in Egypt were panicked and ready for the people to leave. They didn't want them around anymore. And the enemies, according to Rahab, the enemies were fearful and panicked about Israel coming near, and they didn't really want them around either. In both cases, they passed across on dry land. And it's interesting, the water. This Now, I may be forcing this a little bit. So if I am, you just, uh, how Grant used to say, uh, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones. There may be a lot of bones in this. But if not, we'll enjoy the broth, if there's something there. 
but this was interesting to me. I'm a very visual person. I like analogies and I like metaphor and I just I love this stuff. And I just see them. They just go popping like that through my brain. So sometimes I kind of get out of hand. But let's look at these and you discern. Um, the water and the way the water behaved at these two crossings is different. Or how the way God handled the water in these two is different, it seems. That at the Red Sea, it says <clears throat> they stood up like walls. They were walls on the left and the right, on both sides of them. So here are these two tall walls, these long corridors in front of them of the water standing up so that the people can cross between on dry land. Now, on, at the Jordan, it says the water, uh, it seems like the description is the water on the one side heaped up, but then on the other side, it drained down to nothing. So it just dried up on that side. And it's the, the land is dry that they pass on. But the water is mounding up here, and here it's standing at attention on both, uh, making a corridor. And so um, I think one of them was horizontally impressive. The other one was vertically impressive. I think it was mounding up. It was heaping. It was getting taller. This thing is, as they're waiting, this wall of water is even growing. And so there's this uh, vertical impressiveness in a horizontal one. I think there's, I envision this, and it may be from my watching too many movies, but I see this wall of water with a, an avenue down the middle uh, out of Egypt. It's a corridor, an avenue, a grand avenue through which the people can can be ex escor escorted out of free, uh, bondage. And on the other side, it's almost like the it's a, a grand gate that swings open because all of the water has gone down below. So it swings open and opens wide to welcome them in to Canaan. So there's a, a grand avenue and a grand gate. Um, there's a, a red carpet exit. And there is, it's like as the water mounting up, there's a sentinel standing guard there welcoming them in. It's a guard at the gate who welcomes them in. And and like uh, like the men do at the or someone, uh, somebody in the army does, standing at the foot of Air Force One as the president comes up, there's always someone standing there at attention, ready to salute him when he gets on and when he gets off. I feel like it's it was something like that as the people enter in, that the go, the, there's this sentinel that's just growing in size and enormity that's there standing, waiting patiently and welcoming them into this this uh, gift gifted land. Um, a land that's given to them as a gift. So, it may be too much, but I, I think there's something there about how God is treats us like royalty, that he treats us very specially when we obey, when we trust him, that he does it differently a little bit time by time. There's no cookie cutter, but there's still something to the consistency of his treating us with kindness, with uh, favor, with uh, reward, and that he does it in very majestic ways in royal kingly fashion. So there's something there. The, uh, they carried the royal gold of Egypt out and uh, it was attached to their bodies in earrings and necklaces and such. And they carried the gold of God in as it was attached to the ark. It was laid on there attached to God. So there's something going on there. There's a, it, I think represents something of um, a break with the gods of Egypt uh, that were the external type things. And then there's this uh, bringing God near. Uh, so there's a connection with God as they enter into Canaan. So, the, and these connections continue into chapter 5. I'm not assigned to, to teach on chapter 5, but there's something there um, connecting with the Passover and the blood on the doorpost. And then here's the, the circumcision of the people's blood. And there's some connections. There's some something swirling there. So whoever teaches chapter 5 will be able to share those with you. But there are some obvious connections and contrasts. So they were to take these five stones, and I think this is a big piece of the chapter, are the five, uh, the twelve stones. And so, what, what, what are the, where, how, what do these stones mean? Uh, first of all, their placement I think is interesting to consider. Uh, one man from each tribe took the stones. Of course, these, th their purpose is to commemorate the event. Is to have something tangible to take and put on the side so that one day when their children who are 30, 40, 50, 100 years later doubted or wondered about the the uh, truthfulness of the story, if it ever was considered to be a myth and not reality, 
it was so that they could come back and actually put their hands on the stones. They could see them with their eyes. They could put their hands on them and they could know that here is the stone that our man, our tribe's man took and put down. Here's the one that Judah took and put down. Here's the one that the, uh, Gad took and put down. And so uh, there were tangible evidences. And we have things like that in our lives. Uh, you know, we have wedding rings to commemorate and remind us of a commitment that we've made. We have... Um, um, photos that we take to say, yeah, see, I was here, I was there, we did this, we saw that. So we have uh, flags on top of Mount Everest, for example, to say Americans were here or Brazilians or somebody was here. And uh, we have memorials and markers to mark battles, to commemorate uh, special events that took place. And so we have these kinds of things ourselves. And we know what they are to do. Well, Israel had theirs, and I wonder how they arranged them. Um, did they stack them in a column on one on top of the other? If so, in what order? And or did they just heap them up randomly? My guess, and this is my guess, is that they put them out in the same order and design and fashion as they would have been the camps have been arranged around the tabernacle or as the stones were on the ephod. Um, I think they probably did that in order that it, and it may have been that they did that in order that they could come back and someone from the tribe of uh, Gad or Iskar could say, that was our stone. Our man, your great, 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 great grand daddy back there, picked that stone up and put that stone down. We were here. Your people were here. This is a true story. This chapter 12, I'm sorry, this chapter 4, by the way, is the story that they would have been retelling, centering around those stones of how they passed over. And so they would have been able to point and touch that stone to commemorate it. So every tribe had a man there, and every man had a story. And so I want us to move into something more practical. By the way, just to mention that Israel, anytime you go through the wilderness, you come out with something more when you go through it. Israel went in, uh, and, and they, those 40 years were not lost. You think about it, here are the things they brought out that they didn't have before. They didn't have... When they went in, they didn't have the tabernacle. When they came out, they had it. When they went in, they didn't have the priesthood. When they came out, they had the priesthood. When they went in, they didn't have the Torah. When they came out, they did. They had the stories. They had the memories. They had the live um, illustrations among them. Here was Joshua and others, who had, and Cain, Caleb, who had actually gone in before and seen the whole thing. They had all of this history that they didn't have before. When you go into the wilderness... Um, and you suffer through it, you come out rich, and you have this relationship with God that you didn't have before. Now, we have these stories. Uh, Joshua and, and the people who came out of Canaan had these stories. They had these stones as one example of a story, of the climax of the story, of the coming out and entry into Canaan. But they also had other stories of the quail and the water and of the disobediences, and of Phineas, and of the ground opening up and swallowing, and a lot of stories that were there that were passed on to them, they brought out. And so a practical application of this is something I'd like to consider because I, I really, I, I like to come out with something to do, something that I can apply to my faith right away. And so for you, I have, you all, I have two suggestions here of things to do that you really should do and and the way i am um when, when i hear preachers teach and preach to me and they give an idea a lot of times i just let it float on by because i'm such a self-starter and i always think i have my own ideas and i don't know i'm not very good at all that stuff but i hope you're better than i am i hope some of you are and i hope you'll put these into practice because they really do make a difference these are terrific and they will make a difference for your family. It will benefit your children the way that the stones were to benefit the children, the children's children in Israel. These will benefit your children. It will grow their faith. It just actually will. And you don't have to wait forever to do it. And so what you need to do is, is to ask yourself, what are your stories? What are your milestones? What are the memories, the experiences in your life where God showed up? What are those? Um, a good place for you to start, parents I'm talking to, a good place for you to start, for example, is to go to your parents, if they're still living, and ask them, Mom, Dad, tell us the stories of faith. Tell us the stories of your journey. How did you come to know God? 
And where have you seen him answer prayer? When were you tempted? When did you stumble? How did you, when did you unite with him and obey him and see it work out as he had promised that it would work out? Or who are people that you've seen and watched either follow God and be blessed or fall away from God and be cursed? What, what are the stories in your parents' lives? Have them share those with you and have them share them with your children. And then if you don't have parents of faith or you don't have a history or legacy of faith, but you're the first in your family, as I was one of the first ones in my family, um, <clears throat> then you have you bring to the table your stories, your stones. As if you have gone out into the presence of God, you've gone out and you've obeyed and you've followed God along and you got to a Jordan it came to some point where it was time to cross, and you crossed, and now you're bringing out this stone, this memorial, this story that is a verification of what it is, what it means, and what happens when you follow God. For myself, one of my first stories that I had was when I was 12. And you'll be asking yourself, when was the first one? But the first one was when I was 12. I'd just been immersed into Christ, and so I was looking forward to the communion the next week I was going to have, uh, we call it the Lord's Supper. And we only had that for believers. And so I was ready to do that. So the next Sunday, uh, we were at the Sunday attending group. And um, and I went and I and I had the, the, the little bread and I had the juice. And then there was time to give. We took up a collection. <clears throat> and my understanding was that the, that our righteousness that we should all give, Christians should give, and that our righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, I don't know where I heard that, some sermon, but anyway, that's what I heard. That's what I understood. And so I had also heard that the Pharisees sometimes gave 30% or 40%. Now, that may have been true, may not have been true, but that's what I heard as I was 12 somewhere. And so in my mind, I thought, well, I've got to exceed that, so I better give 50%. So I did. I had 50 cents. And I gave 25 cents. I gave a quarter, <clears throat> a 25 cent piece. That's what I gave as my donation. 50% of what I had out of obedience because I believed God and I believed that I should do life the way he said to do it. It's very innocent. I misunderstood a lot of that as far as uh, what the Pharisees gave and what, uh, what righteousness really was and how we'd exceed that of the Pharisees. But I did what I knew to do in following God. And you know what? The next uh, week, <clears throat> when I looked at my little shoebox where I collected my money for mowing grass and gifts and money I found on the ground or around the house, um, <clears throat> I had a dollar. My, my wealth had grown. And so I took 50 cents. I took half of it, and I gave it that next Sunday. And I remember distinctly the next week I looked in my box when it was time to go to church and I had $2. So every week had been doubling. And I tell people, man, I wish I'd kept that up. <laughs> I wish I had. But I did keep up the believing and the following God. And there are other stories that I can now bring to my children of times that I obeyed. I listened and I did the hard thing. When I was in high school, there were some things that I, I conf was confronted by an opportunity to, to attend an event with all the popular kids. And yet I knew that there would be drinking and some inappropriate stuff going on there. And I had to call the fellow who had invited me and I had to say, I can't come. Because he had asked for, you know, reserve, let us know if you're coming. And I had to call and I said, well, I can't come. And he asked me why. Oh, I was hoping I would get by without explaining why. But he asked me why. And so I told him. And, you know, I didn't get invited to any more parties after that. Until the last year when I was a senior in high school. And then I was invited. And it was in that time that I actually found out that there was an opportunity there to be an example of someone who later became a follower of Jesus. So I did not understand all of that that first time. But I only knew I needed to follow God. And God blessed it in the long run. And he took care of me. And... Um, and so I have story after story. In fact, I wrote a book, you know, many of you at Beth Coon received a copy of Provisions, uh, which is a, an accounting of 28 years of our life and how God handled certain aspects of it for us in just marvelous, marvelous, extraordinary ways. And, um, and those are stories that I'm passing on to my kids. I wrote those down to pass on to my kids. You don't have to write a book. You could write down your stories, but you can certainly tell them to your kids. And so I'm encouraging you to sit down with your children and begin to tell them the stories of where you obeyed or where you failed to obey and what happened. But share with them your stones, your stories, so that they can turn and say, there was faith in my family and here's how it played out. 
The second point that is important in this uh, text is the fear of God, is gaining a fear for God. And fear is so misunderstood by us, and it's not a quake in your boots, he's going to zap me kind of fear. But it's, uh, the, it's, the, it's the knowledge that that could happen, but it's more than, it's beyond that, it's better than that. It is the respect, the reverence, the, he is so enormous, he is so big, he is so great and wonderful in love and power and ability. And it's a whole package that is what it means to fear God. And so um, I would want you to share with your children that God is not a tame God. He's not a tameable God. He is a faithful God. He is a for us God. He's opposed to evil. His timing is perfect. His ways are just. His laws are firm. These are lessons that the, the people of Israel could have shared with their children coming out to show them why they should fear God, how they should respect God, and why they should honor Him and follow Him. It's because of the things they had learned in their life that taught them that God is worthy of being trusted and followed and respected and revered and feared. And so think about in your life, what are the lessons you've learned? What is it that makes you respect and reverence and revere God? And share those stories with your kids so that they'll have reasons to respect and reverence and revere to fear God and to choose to follow Him through their wildernesses because they will have them and they will need a God that they know will lead them out of slavery and into a promise. So as we look forward to that, empower your children with these stones of remembrance, with these stories and accounts of what God has done in your life and what you have learned about His character that makes you respect and reverence and awe and stand in awe of Him. Do that and you will bless your generations the way that Joshua had hoped to bless those who followed Him.